Martin. Good afternoon, Karim. How are you? How are you there? You doing good? I'm very, very well, thank you. Um, happy New Year, if it's not uh, too late. And to you. And to you. Uh, I never know when it is too late to say Happy New Year, but for uh, for you, Martin, it's, it's yeah. never too late. Oh, well, thank you. Um, put it this way, there's an awful lot worse things people say to each other, so any of the year, Happy New Year's okay. You're looking well, you're looking well. Oh, thank you, uh, and you. It's, uh, we're trying our best to, to stay well at these times, so we are. Yeah, it's... You know, it's a very... I'm sure we'll go into this in more detail, but it's very strange in that, that sometimes you start to not remember that this is abnormal. Yep. And other times you realise just how strange it is. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, which is one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why I wanted you to come back on. Actually, uh, you're the first guest that we've had on making a second appearance. Oh, uh, thank you. That's and, an honour. Uh, <laughs> a, a very timely one, like a a, a very timely one. It, it was always my, uh, I always wanted to have you appear again and come back on, and and I would love you to come on even after this, because there's so Anytime. much so much we can talk about. But uh, just the now, I, I reached out particularly at this time because I just think that for many, many people, uh, some of my friends, some of my students, some of the people that listen to the podcast, things have just got difficult uh, for mm. a lot of people. Uh, and I thought Martin's the man to speak to. So um, I was so chuffed when you you said straight away, yep, I'll, I'll, I'll come straight back on, which is which is brilliant. Well, happy to do it. I mean, I've noticed uh, a raise in the level of emails and messages I'm getting on Messenger and things like that. Um, just saying thanks for what I'm doing, but then the next paragraph or the next sentence is, I've been really struggling lately. You know, and I think it's well. I think there's a couple of things. Um, there's the the length of it. You know, we have been now going almost a year yeah. with this strange, curtailed way of living. Um, but I think also the people start start to not be able to handle things that are normal, but because they have been so repeated, it's, it's just they start to get worn out by it. And that, of course, from a mindfulness point of view, is is just a complete crazing that's created by the mind. Yeah. And if you could magically see that, it would just disappear in an instant. Uh, but that's one thing to say, totally another thing to do. Yeah. I think, uh, well, let's take a wee quick step back. I was, yeah. it was, uh, it was six months ago, almost, that you were, you were on the, the podcast the first time. And... I actually went back and watched a wee bit of the episode this morning, and it was uh, it was the summer. It was really bright. Uh, we were talking about hearing the birds singing because the, the country was really properly closed down at that time, and there was no flights, and everyone was home. And there was a there, there seemed to be a novelty about the lockdown that people were actually enjoying. You yourself actually said that that the from a personal point of view, just speaking for yourself, that you were enjoying the quiet, et cetera. But over the next six months, uh, and the amount of people that have, that have maybe not, I wouldn't describe it as, well, yeah, they probably have is reached out to myself, students, friends, and said, I'm struggling now. And that from the last time we spoke and it was lovely and bright, and then we got to Christmas time and, and then the, the year turned over and it's dark and, and people have slowly but surely lost that novelty for sure. And it really, really worries me where a lot of people are with their mental health at the moment. I think there's, there's a couple of things in there, um, Karim. I think the first thing is that we were really lucky in retrospect. The weather was amazing yeah. from lockdown in March through right home through the summer. So people were told you can you can't go out unless you're going out for your walks, you know, your your exercise. And everybody was going out. Why? Because well, 
stuck in the house or it's like 19 degrees and sunny every day for like six weeks, you know. Yeah. Um, so that was very fortunate. But in hindsight as well, not taking anything away from how good that was, it maybe lulled us into a false sense of, you know, this isn't too difficult to get through. Yeah. But of course, you know, in the, the Old Testament and the Psalms and the, what do you call it, the Dirt's version of the song, um, to everything there is a season, you know. Um, and, you know, spring's followed by summer, which is great, but then autumn comes and it can be a wee bit beautiful, but a bit slushy. And then winter comes. Yeah. And with winter, it's as you say, you know, we're in Northern Europe. Um, it's, you know, shorter days, longer nights. A lot of people don't like that, even when there's no issues going on. Yeah, yeah. They get sad syndrome, you know. Yeah. Um, and so this would be affecting people anyway. Mm -hmm. But lockdown obviously just magnifies it so much. Yeah. And again, it's it's not that I get frustrated because frustration is just another thing you need to manage away. But if I was to get to say a word about how I feel about the whole year, taking away the tragic losses of life, you know. But the thing that I wish would have been different is if people can just get a really deep enough understanding of what the human mind is actually like and then learn the skills of actually managing it because what it's like is not always helpful. You know, Millions of people, I mean, literally millions of people would not be suffering anything like the extent they are just now. Because you can see that, you know, when people say they're at the end of their tether, well, they've probably said that 10 times in the last 30 years. And there is no end to that tether. Yeah. The tether just disappears. And you start over again. Now, if you can see that and just magic it away as the, the junk that it is, and that's not a criticism of anyone, but that's because it arises in my mind as well. But junk arises in your mind out of nothing. Mm -hmm. um, even worrying about your, like my, my, my two children, who are 25 and 30, they worry about us catching COVID. Yeah. Because yeah. we're early 60s, you know. Um, now, chances are, A, we're not going to because the majority of people don't. And the chances are when you do get it, you'll be okay. But there is the chance that it could all go wrong. But that's no reason to ruin your life worrying. Yeah. You know, and people do. People, millions of people are worrying, 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 and fretting, fretting, fretting. And all that's doing is making it more likely that if they do catch the COVID, to catch COVID, then they'll be in a worse situation because their physical body is being worn out by all this worry. Yeah. So it's, it's a really, up here in the mind is a very strange place. Let, let's jump in then to, to being, talking about mindfulness then technically and, and because I've, my, my automatic, uh, Okay, my automatic uh, thought is always to help. And if someone comes to you for help, then that's, uh, they're obviously seeking that help. But I, I will put my hands up and say that I'm guilty of, of just trying to help even when there's a good chance that I'm making it worse. Um, it's not wanted. And, and, I, and I still feel that that's, the nicer type of person to be that I just like to help people. Uh, but some people, they'll tell me directly, and that's that's brilliant and it's honest. And some people, I just know how they react to it, that I would say, okay, let's put some positive steps in, even some mindful steps throughout the day. If you commit to this, I can, can't guarantee you, but I've got a good confidence that it's going to make things better. And their automatic reaction is, well, it won't, or you don't fully understand, or it can't be as simple as that, or or whatever. So how how do we, how would someone like yourself who's who's a, a resident mindfulness expert mm -hmm. uh, 
start with someone who just felt that all of this was getting and talking to them at the minute, which I think a lot of people are yeah. at the end of that tether you were talking about. Uh, now, it might not be that they are, but they, they genuinely feel that they are at the moment. I think the first thing is to recognise that people will respond negatively when they're feeling negative. You know, it's a, it's a kind of, it's a makes the, the situation worse. Yeah. They're feeling rotten, they mention that, they complain, they, they moan, or they express a fear or a worry, and you try to help them. But because they're already in a negative mood, they're more likely to dismiss what you're suggesting, not because it's not a correct way out, but because they're just in a bad mood. <laughs> you know? yeah. It's like somebody saying, you know, oh, I'm eating junk food, it's terrible. Well, here's an apple and say, oh, no, no, that'll just make matters worse. You know, it's, it's not sane, but it, it's a normal response. Yeah. I think the other thing is just because someone reacts negatively or dismissively doesn't mean what you've said to them hasn't sunk in mm -hmm. and that maybe at some point they will use that. I mean, I've had emails from people saying, you won't remember me, but I was one of 500 people at a talk you gave in, I don't know, let's say Blantyre. Um, and um, it was nine years ago. I think, of course, I won't remember. I don't remember five days ago, let alone nine years ago. Um, but something you said always struck me, you know, it struck a chord with me. And lately it's beginning to help me enormously. I just want to say thank you. And I just think, this is the scattergun effect as a strategy. If you, which is back to your point of you want to help. If you want to help, then just put good ways of helping out there. Mm -hmm. And someone somewhere will get it just at the right time. Um, another person will get it at the wrong time, but it sinks in. Um, and I, I'm not, as you know, I'm not a religious person, but this, here's the second scripture quote I'm going to go you know, in, in the New Testament, you know, in Christianity, um, they've Jesus talks about the parable of the talents, you know, or sowing the seeds, you know, which is a, two versions of the same parable, which basically, you know, you don't know what happens. Some people as a teacher, some people you teach and it's the seed on stony ground. It doesn't take root, it just lies there and it rots. Some people, it starts to go down, but it's in kind, kind of rocky soil. So it grows a bit and then it's stunted. Mm -hmm. Other people fully flourish because it falls on you know, fertile ground, if you like. And I think that's the same. We can't lay out the ground. You know, all we can do is put something in that can plant a seed. Um, and then it's beyond us. And I think that's that's important for teachers, you know, for people who others come to for advice is do think very carefully what you're saying to people, how you present it to them. Uh, and that takes skill and experience, and I'm not pretending that I've always got that right. Um, but that's all you can do is just give what you can, having thought it through properly. Then it's up to other people. Um, I mean, again, there are people who have come to me and asked for help, and I've heard afterwards that they've not really done anything with it. And another person who's got the exact same issue, and I've heard otherwise that you know their life's totally transformed by it. Yeah. Now, I can't do anything about that. Um, I've done my bit, you know. It's um, we have finite abilities and finite time. Use it well, and then again, the Dalai Lama said really, really well one time, um, as he always does. He said, you know, if you have an issue, you should think about it to the best you can, and then you should deal with it the best you can, and then you should forget it. Because after that, you've done your bit, you know, yeah. and you can't do anything else, yeah. you know, and that's so important for your own peace of mind as somebody trying to help other people and to allay your own doubts about whether you're helping them better, you know, right, you know, when you, you, you let that rankle in your mind, 
which is just unhealthy for you. Yeah. Um, and how people receive it is just a result of all their genes and life experiences, which we've spoken about before. Mm -hmm. And some people's timing is just bad, and some people's timing is good. Um, and again, there's nothing you can do about that. You can't change their genes. You can't go back in time and stop them having that terrible moment that made them pessimistic. Yep. Yep. The, you've, since the beginning of lockdown, uh, you've put in place a number of online sort of live sessions and Facebook sessions and some uh, workshops, uh, yep. one of which I was lucky enough to be on maybe about a month ago there. Uh, what was your, if someone says, I think the question was going to be there, what, what was your intention there? How did you feel that your, your sharing of your mindfulness practices, for somebody again who maybe not know anything about mindfulness, you really dedicated, uh, and I think I'll say it for a lot of time, I sort of fell into the Facebook post that you were doing, the, the the wider community, I would imagine, and many people would have done, I'll say it here on this podcast, we're so th or I'm so thankful that you decided to dedicate so much time to that. As a, an experienced mindfulness practitioner and coach and teacher and instructor, what was your aim through that? It was obviously to keep people in a, a good mindful place, but can we talk a wee bit about how if we had have followed that all the way through, it would have been good for people yeah i think we have to go back to before lockdown so i was doing the free weekly class at the university of western scotland campus yep. you know for the general public on a tuesday evening and i've been doing that for nine years yep. um, and all through that time i've been thinking what else can i give knowing that i have to earn an income mm -hmm. but a lot of people can't afford to pay for these kind of services so how do you square that? Um, and my first thought was set, start a class locally. And as you know, um, by the time we got to lockdown, we were getting on average about 90 people yeah. um, and between 75 and 130, I think, um, each week in the last couple of years. That's, that's a massive number for, no disrespect to my hometown, but like a place like Hamilton. You, know, yeah. you might think, you know, yeah, in the flowery, West End of Glasgow, where everybody's hip and, you know, and yep. these kind of things, or in Edinburgh and Morningside. But, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> I, I mean, I came back to live in Hamilton because this is my roots and this is where I feel home is, you know. Um, I was raised here. and But I know it, you know, this is a post-industrial, working-class town with a lot of issues, but a lot of really nice people and a lot of nice places and villages around it. And I love it to bits. Um, but mindfulness does not naturally fit. Yeah. So it's great that lots of people did it, and it showed um, there was a demand for truly understanding well-being and dealing with people dealing with their own issues. Mm -hmm. um, so when lockdown happened, my first thought was a lot of these people have been coming for years to the class. A lot of them suffering from anxiety, some from depression, some with no problems at all who are just interested in becoming even better in their life. And, and I think that's my whole philosophy of this is to make people happier and more fulfilled in this beautiful temporary thing we've got called life, um, knowing that it ends. So it's harder to do it afterwards than before, you know. Just, it's before. Not. <laughs> um, and so... Uh, I got thinking, and then I found, I mean, I knew about Facebook Live because my daughter's company had been using it, um, but I didn't know how to how to do it. So I think from mid-March to the end of March, I fumbled through it, and then eventually I got to know how it worked. Um, and I was asking people who were coming along saying, when suited you best? You know, and got to a, a kind of general rule of thumb of quarter past 11, quarter past eight at night. So a morning and an evening one, it's almost like coffee time. And then before you settle down to the last program, you know, on telly or something. Yeah. And started doing that. Um, and it just proved very successful. But the, the thinking behind it initially was, how do I sustain the support I was giving to people who I was already helping? 
And then, of course, the internet being the internet, at the peak of lockdown with people sharing, we were getting three and 4,000 views, you know, which is nothing compared with the Joe Wicks, you know, the millions, but that's a lot of human beings yeah. being helped by just somebody sitting in a room for 15 minutes, you know, guiding them. So that was very rewarding, you know, personally to see that you could help a lot of people. But then Morna, my work colleague, and I were saying, what else can we do? Knowing still that we, we know this is all free, so we've still got to try to earn a living. Yeah. And most of it earning a living, not all of it, because we've been doing webinars for the last few years, but most of it was me going out to different places, and primarily in Scotland, and delivering introductory talks or doing sort of eight sessions over a space of a couple of months um, with, with organisations, private sector, public sector, NHS, for example, and the third sector. Um, and that was all now not cut off completely because a lot of people then did transfer to, to Zoom and Teams and stuff, but a lot of it was reduced. So we're having this issue of trying to be altruistic and trying to earn a living, mm -hmm. which is a challenge. If anybody who's tried to do it, it's a challenge. So but at one point we said, well, we got some support from um, a Swedish foundation or a Swedish London-based Swedish foundation, a family business that set up their own foundation. The One of the main members of the family had somehow or other come across one of my books and read it, and she'd been studying mental health. You know, she'd had her own challenges and issues. She'd been studying it for about 20 years, and she had never liked the way it was presented in all the other classic books. Mm -hmm. And she, she phoned me up one day and just basically said, I think the way you exp explain it is the best way I've heard to explain it, and we'd like to help you. I thought, whoa, that's the sort of phone call you don't get very often. Yeah. And it was really good. So they helped us from August through to December. Now, in the end, it didn't quite work out because they were wanting to go kind of almost like parallel paths. They wanted us to do that and we were kind of doing that, you know, slightly differently. But definitely enough for us to say it's not worth us sacrificing the way we want to do things yeah. to get money, which was a real shame because that was us basically, they were essentially funding us a basic income in order to be able to do our things for free. Yeah. Yeah. Not just some of the things, but all of the things. So at that time, we then started using our site to put on online courses, workshops, talks, videos, etc. cetera. Um, and the whole point always has been, how do you reach as many people as effectively as possible? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's it. You know, back to what I said earlier, you know, when you're dead, it's difficult to help people. When you're alive, it's possible. If you think about it, you can help more people than if you don't think about it. And if you're wise and skill, skillful and clever, you can find ways to actually help. Joe Wicks is a great example. You know, I've got huge admiration for him. You know, this is a guy who, the way he has worked it through and thought it through, is sitting there saying, okay, guys, boom, 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 boom. Yeah. And people's bodily health has improved by a guy who's switched on yeah. in the internet and through YouTube and helping millions of people. It's also helped him in his life and he's become successful, famous, wealthy, whatever. But that doesn't matter. That's a side effect. That's him helping people and yeah. that's an enormous uh, credit to him. So we're trying to help people as many as we can and as skillfully as we can. So we've learned more about recordings, we've learned more about videos, and um, we've thought through, like even just last night, um, a week or two ago, I was thinking, I mean, always watching kind of documentaries on health, and the now old subject of sitting is not good for you yeah. um, came up again, and I thought, I do practices twice a day when I say to people, sit down, yep. uh, we're going to do this. And I thought, I do my own going to bed and waking up practice lying in bed because that's where I am. Yep. I thought, but I haven't for a long time done a lying down session. Okay, yep, yep. And, how, and how would you do that recording it? Because you'd have to have the camera up in the ceiling, you know, looking down on you. So, yep. I mean, they're minor things, but so I sorted that out. And we just did the first one last night. 
And I said to people, this is an experiment to see how do you feel? And a lot of people said, oh, that felt so relaxing. It was better, you know. And so I'm introducing that into the mix now, if you like. Um, and that means, therefore, that more people will find more benefit because we're still innovating yeah. in this way. And, and that will go on as long as my wee brain can still continue to think new things. It's one of the things that you, you said there, and, and it makes perfect sense, uh, was you, you talked about Hamilton. So I, I don't need to describe Hamilton again. I think you've done a brilliant, brilliant job because there'll be people listening. Uh, well, actually, I was looking at the statistics and stuff for the, the, the podcast just the other day. And mm-hmm. We've actually got a listener in Brazil, which I thought... Yeah. Wow, <laughs> maybe somebody's just stumbled on it by mistake. But anyway, it showed up. So we're, we're talking to people all around the world, yeah. which, which is just quite extraordinary. But uh, I had, I was doing a little experiment, which I kind of took from you or stole from you with somebody else, obviously virtually, but uh, was using a blueberry. Now, the experiment mm. or the 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 exercise was you would usually teach it with the cold water yep and i was using a blueberry and i eat blueberries most days and i like to put it in yogurt uh maybe a wee bit of honey on top and i'm not particularly mindful on how i eat them so i just eat the yogurt and go on with my day Uh, you can give me any trouble for that later so (laughs) that's the way it's done uh now when I, actually, the more the, the fact that you you ruin a beautiful blueberry by putting other stuff on it. Well, listen, that that, that that's the point as well, and, and you're spot on because when I was doing this week experiment with this blueberry about looking at it first of all, and mm-hmm. then closing my eyes and just actually touching it and feeling how a blueberry feels, and I'm, I'm doing my Billy Conley thing here. I will get to the point. It's all right. This is John Cabot's in stuff, by the way, which is he did it with a raisin 30, yeah. 30, 40 years ago. So you've reinvented so something specific. The looking at it, touching it, smelling it, and then tasting it. Now, many years ago I used to work in Costa Coffee. And one of the things that I picked up then was where you tasted coffee in your mouth. So a nice coffee you should feel down the center of your tongue. Mm-hmm. And as coffee burns and it becomes acidic, you your acidic receptors are at the side of your tongue. Right. So for the first time ever, I had the blueberry in the mouth and I was now chewing it and actually trying to be as mindful as I could through the full process. As you know better than anybody, sometimes your mind can go off. And part yeah. of the, the task of mindfulness is bringing it back. One, one of the places where my mind went to was, why do people not, and this is, you'll work this much better than I will, why do people not get this? People, most of the people, not most, some people I know in Hamilton would be, away you go, you're eating a blueberry, what's all this fuss about? Whereas you could sell this, and I use the word sell, uh, maybe, maybe erroneously, but you could sell this to a, pro, a, a, a workshop in the West End of Glasgow or somewhere in London, but I think this is a wonderful thing that, that you're an expert in, that I'm still an absolute novice in. And, and again, we touched on this at the beginning of the podcast, but I just want to sh- sort of share this because it will help people. Uh, and that blueberry was a brilliant experiment that I've done just to be really mindful of how things tasted and the feeling in the mouth and then as it went down and and usually I just stuff it in and got on me got on with my day. But my mind definitely went away to people would just be laughing at me here. That they're just they're not really open to 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 this idea of meditation or mindfulness or any of these things that we can do to help us. So I I laugh and for a good few reasons. I mean so Bob Dylan won the Nobel Prize for Literature, okay? Yeah. One of the most highly respected 
composers of the 20th century, lyricists, poets. And, right, and rightly so. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. But there are some people who say he's rubbish. Yep. <laughs> yeah. They're wrong, Martin. They're wrong. Same with the Beatles. Yep. Yeah. Same with Shakespeare. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I write poetry. Some folk, most folk don't know that I write poetry. Some folk know I write poetry, don't like it. Some folk know I write poetry, read it and like it. That's just the way human nature is. It will always be that way. The percentages of people who know about your stuff, on like mindfulness, will depend on how well it's promoted. Mm -hmm. um, the amount of people who like it and buy into it is, again, beyond our control. And as is those who buy into it and like it. So we can't control that side of it. But my pleasant surprise, which I mentioned earlier, was that in Hamilton, you get 120 people going to a mindfulness class. You know, that's something unusual, mm -hmm. higher than expected. But also, I mean, one of the great things about mindfulness is it's about reality. 120 real people getting real benefit from a practice, from a session. Yeah. Now, the, if I hadn't done that, then that would be 120 less people getting mental health benefit. And it's as simple as that. Now, it's a drop in the ocean, even in Hamilton, because Hamilton's 50-odd thousand people. But it's still 120 people. Yeah. You know, and even if it was just one person, even if nobody turned up, but there was a mouse trapped in a corner, and I noticed the mouse trapped in the corner, and I let it out, yeah. it would still be of benefit. And that is really how, how I view it. At every moment when you can be mindful, because mindfulness is hard work, you know, you can't, it's difficult to always be mindful. But at every moment that you are mindful, you can turn a situation into a better situation than your default reaction would, would do, because your default reaction is almost always crap. Yep. <laughs> you know, yep. it's, that's not quite true, but it's, it's never the best. It's never the best reaction possible. If you spend three seconds thinking about something, you'll come up with something better than your automatic mind would. Yeah, yeah. The, which might, that might lead into the next wee note that I've got here, actually. Uh, and, and what I wanted to do today was help people again. Or, or and again, every I, I, the, we had a, with a gentleman in the podcast before Christmas time who was a kettlebell expert. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was actually one of my friends in the States who put me on to him. And uh, my friend calls this uh, coach his strength sensei, okay? Uh, are we play on the martial arts side, I think. Yeah, yeah. And I was thinking that that you actually come into my head there, uh, and this is a sort of a quirky compliment, I think, that we're giving you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, christen you today, I guess, as the, the mind sensei. So mm -hmm. that's, your, that's your new title in, in my head anyway. Uh, oh, that's nice. Keep it there. <laughs> just... Uh, when, when he's looking to, 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 to learn new kettlebell stuff, he knows he has a source where he goes to. And mm. you over the, the number of years. And again, talking to all these people that you've helped, like I've very, very rarely flirted in and out of your class. Uh, and I really I wish I really should be more consistent with it. Anyway, that's the way I, I, I see you. So I genuinely take your advice really sort of seriously. Uh, well, thank you. And, and, and meditate on it, dare I say, and mm. contemplate on it. Uh, two, two of the things that two other subjects that I was wanting to move on to, and they might be to the same thing. Uh, the first thing is I've written down uh, boundaries, okay? And the second thing was the main reason that people are feeding back to me that's causing anxiety at the moment 
isn't even the 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 COVID nineteen virus that's still well we're, we're, we've just come through a period where we were getting higher numbers than we did six and eight nine months ago. So yeah. that virus is should still be a concern, but the people that are reaching out to me are, are, are reaching out because they can't put boundaries in place now. Mm. And what's causing that is, and, and three things that I wrote down was uh, general stress, homeschooling, which is a big deal at the moment, uh, and then work. And they're all happening within the same four walls. And then looking at the martial arts for, for a second, I'm asking people to come on to a Zoom class that evening. And mm -hmm. some of the feedback, and, and it's absolutely spot on, they've either been looking at their kid's computer all day or they've been looking at their own computer. So they either can't face another computer at night time or this boundary thing, and this is a big one, people can't close their laptop. They just, I've, I've, my own wife is suffering through this at the moment that she's really struggling to put boundaries in place to when when is finishing a clock when is that uh, what can we do practically and mindfully or what can we suggest to people to try and help them with those problems okay i might need to come back to your notes okay if you yeah, can of course of course, it. of course but, but to begin with what popped into my head was so I'm 62 in a week and a half's time or so, right? So I've been alive for over half a century. And I've been interested in sport in all that time and played football pretty high level and all that stuff. And I've seen world records come and go. I've seen people getting fitter, faster, stronger. And that's not just chance. That's because through the wonders of science, we've learned more and more about the human body, how to nurture it, how to do that safely, how to do that within limits. And as a result, people have got better, yeah. you know, in their sports. And that's, you just look at the facts and you see that's the case. It's the same with the mind. We're about a half a century, a century behind about mental health. And that's partly because the scientists haven't been able to look at the body in terms of the mind. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're looking at somebody's brain up until now, you know, up until 40 years ago, it's because that person was dead. You know, I no amount of work on that brain is going to help them. Um, but now we've got... MRI scanners and we've the neuroscientists have started to do brilliant experiments to understand how does this brain actually work? How does it work from split moment to split moment? What's happening in there? Why do we make decisions? And then they've started theorizing about well, we must have evolved these certain traits, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's a now the beginnings, and it is just the beginnings, but the beginnings of a deep understanding of how we are what we are, why we are, what we are. And prior to that, like with um, Freud and Jung and people like that before, they were trying to work it out in their head without evidence, just with people's stories, and a lot of it was wrong. But now we're getting towards truth of understanding. Now, we haven't really started to implement that in the same way as athletics and football and rugby and other sports have done the physical bit, but that's going to come. Now, I mention that because, because we're at the early stages of this and, you know, when I first started teaching mindfulness in 2004, nobody I knew had heard of it. Nobody at all I knew had heard of it. And I knew about 300 people, many of whom were pretty high up in various things. And had they been researching and searching in the right areas would have found the stuff, but it was total unknown. So it shows you how recent this is. That at least now people have heard of it. Now, hearing about it is just the beginning as well. It's a bit like knowing that fruit and veg are good for you, but you've been reared on meat and two veg for 40 years. Yeah. And people are saying, 
why don't you try quinoa? <laughs> it's like, whoa, what the hell is that? You know, is that not a country in Africa? You know, um, now, so we're so early in this that it's challenging for people to implement it in any ordinary circumstance where there's rows in the house and difficulties at home and worries about this and fears about somebody's health, let alone in the worst crisis I think we've had certainly since the Second World War. Yeah. Um, and again, 62 years old, I've never lived through anything remotely like this. Yeah. Nothing remotely. You know, you know my story of my dad. My dad lived through much, much worse than this. Yeah, yeah. And so that kind of helps me in one way, but it's not my experience. So what I'm saying there in a long-winded way is we can only try this stuff to help us with boundaries. You know, and I think what mindfulness is best at in that regard is if you remember to be mindful, if you just notice that you're end of the tether or you're looking at the screen and thinking, oh, my God, if I got another Zoom meeting, I'm going to break this machine in two. Yeah. And then you notice, if you can notice that you're feeling that way and see the insanity of feeling that way, mm -hmm. and then you can just take a very slow, very deep breath in and think, oh, that's so refreshing. And then you just breathe back out and think, yeah, I need some peace just now. And then do that two or three times. Then all of a sudden you see the laptop and the thing in a different way. Now, the trick is to be able to do that more often when those feelings arise. And that's where the practice, you know, we're not in a good time just now, but generally speaking, yeah, another religious parable here. <laughs> of the Old Testament of Joseph with the Pharaoh, you know, in the dreams, seven years of feast, seven years of famine. In the good years, you should be building up for the bad years. Yeah. Because yeah. this is life. Bad times happen. Somebody's going to get sick sometime in your life that's close to you. Somebody's going to get bad financial news. Somebody's going to get bad news about a job. It always happens. That's the nature of life. So we should be building up such a positive strength of mind that when that stuff happens, A, we know it's going to happen. Don't know when, but we know it's going to happen. So we're okay about it happening. Yeah. Because, well, what's the alternative? Feel terrible about it. Well, it's better to feel okay about something than terrible about something. Yeah, yeah. And then be able to think clearly about what to do about it. So, it, unfortunately, timing and possibly people's lethargy or apathy has not given people in the good years the strength of mental control and mental understanding. So that, and again, I don't mean to make a comparison with myself, but this has not been difficult for me this year. Um, I say that a friend I've known since I was 10 years old died on the 2nd of January. Mm. Um, we've got somebody that lives three doors along who was uh, he's a paramedic, um, not able to go to his house, not able to get out of bed for about a month. Mm. My best man at my wedding, um, wasn't able to get out of bed for about six weeks. Now, so this has been real, you know, for me. My daughter has had to shunt about trying to rework her life and her career. My son was stuck in Japan. We weren't able to go and see him. Then he wasn't able to come home. Then when he went home, he was only able to see his girlfriend because that was the bubble. And therefore, he was now in Edinburgh and we still couldn't see him after a year. And then he got home for Christmas and Katie came home for Christmas as well. And then all of a sudden with the relaxation for Christmas, which was great, and then lockdown yeah. before they left the house. So, and Ian's now got a new job in Copenhagen, yeah, yeah. but he can't get to Denmark. <laughs> you know, so we are four of us in the house. We're normally two of us in the house, me and Christine. We're now four or five of us in the house all the time and have been since Christmas, probably going through to mid-March maybe April, when it was supposed to be for like six days. You know? yeah, so yeah. And the, the reason I mention all of that is that that, in theory, should drive people crazy. And I've managed it. Not just managed it in terms of I'm coping, but 
I'm still as happy and as sane, if I was sane, um, and as calm and peaceful about life, happier probably um, than ever. Now, that's because I've done 20 years of this stuff. It's as, it's as simple as that, you know. It's, it's a bit like, you know, it's not, I know it's not your martial arts uh, particularly, but the, the sort of karate breaking through the, you know, the, the yeah. planks of it stuff, you know. It's, an experienced person can do that so much easier than an inexperienced person. So I can handle certain crises so much easier than other people just through practice. Um, I'm now, glad you said that because that's what I was thinking. Like it's, I think that's a really important point that, that you've, you've you've got to there. That this is through practicing this stuff. It's not that you're sitting there saying, "I'm Martin Stepick, I'm amazing. I get that." I've, uh, no, it's not that at all. It's that you're just the same as everybody, but yeah, put the years of of, of practicing yeah. to make your mind the way it is. It's nothing to do with me. That's the god awful truth, you know, about it. And that's what the Zen books are point up there because that's all my my books up there. <laughs> you mentioned at one point you sort of you said that you were a novice at this, and I think that's an understatement. I think you know this a lot deeper than you maybe give yourself credit for. But I too am a novice at this, and everyone is a novice all the time, and that's what mindfulness teaches you. Don't ever think you know this stuff, because this stuff is like trying to understand the human brain is like trying to understand all of the universe. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's so much more complex and varied. What you can do is learn the rudimentaries of helping to manage it, make things happy when it was sad, make things kinder than when they were sort of meaner and things like that. Um, so I think that when we are able to do that, and it is just practice of building up and building up, then when the stuff hits the fan, we're okay about that. I mean, I am, I've said this dozens of times now, you know, I would like to live to over 100. I would like to see how the world evolves and I'd like to see my children grow up and all that, all the good things in life. But if I get hit by the bus tomorrow, who cares? So what? Really? So what? I'm 62, I'm almost double the age that Bloomin' Robert Burns lived to, you know, and more than double the age that Jimi Hendrix lived to. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not complaining yeah. about an early death, you know, if, if that happens. And that is pure mindfulness. That is an understanding that what you have is the present moment and live that well, like the sip of water, you know. Yeah. Feel the beauty of that. And then if the next thing happens, you know, if a bus comes in here, it'd be really unusual because it's in the house instead. If it gets through the window, boom, and you say, right, okay, well, we'll have Hopefully to not on the podcast, Martin. Yeah, on the podcast, <laughs> you'll have to say, well, um, we seem to have lost Martin to a bus. Um, but if this happens, it happens. And no regrets. So I'd like to live a long life, but if I live a short life, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. All that matters is the present moment and you trying to live your life as fully as you can, and trying not to let your mind get in the way of you enjoying being alive. Who, again, apologies that I'm sitting scribbling as you're, as yeah. you're, you're, you're talking. Uh, one thing that was definitely I, I, I wanted to ask you about, and then I've, I've, I've wrote another word down that, I'll, that I'll, I'll get to very quickly after that, that, that wasn't in my head to chat about today, but you're the, you're the person to speak to. The first point was uh, when you said that this lockdown was meant to be like six days or however short it was meant to be. Uh, how much do you think that? Un and you kind of you were you were you were you were going into that at the end of of uh, your answer there. How much do you think uncertainty plays in people's anxieties and? Uh, unhappiness, maybe or or just that discontent with our mind and the uncertainty is a big thing at the moment. Yeah, by a pure coincidence, I've just been writing about uncertainty and, and change um, and doing you know, a wee video on it, so I'm kind of very clear on that just now. Um, 
all we have is change. I mean, that's the beauty of the other Eastern philosophy of Taoism. Um, Tao, that T-A-O word, means the way the universe flows, basically. If, you know, when put in scientific terms, you put that as the Big Bang, whatever caused the Big Bang, started this thing that we are now part of. You know, we are a tiny little part of this, and Earth is a tiny little part of this astonishing chain, but that's what it is. It's a chain of cause and effect. Things just keep on causing the next thing. And the universe is expanding, boom, 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 and we happen to have evolved. Yeah. However one believes it, boom, and we're alive, and now we're talking. So it's, that's all chain of cause and effect. Event, effect. Now, that's what we're living in. So it's almost like, you know, the earth spins. It does. But we don't get dizzy. Yeah. Now, because we think we're living on something stable, yeah. And it isn't, because it's not only that the Earth doesn't spin, but it's actually going around the sun millions of miles. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, this, and we can't grasp that. So, but that's the reality. There's constant change and constant flow. And that means there's always got to be constant uncertainty, because you can't tell. If everything's changing and everything's slowing, everything's changing from moment to moment, and you don't know what the change is. Yeah. So, We've got a situation where Ian and his girlfriend were trying to get to Copenhagen. It's been postponed two or three times. And now they also, they were planning to get engaged, married at some point anyway. But this has kind of forced it to come quicker because it helps Ian's girlfriend get to Copenhagen because of Brexit. So if it hadn't been for lockdown, if it hadn't been for Brexit, and if it hadn't been for COVID, none of this would have needed to happen. Yeah. So because of each of those, which is two, three different uncertainties and changes, everything's had to be adapted. And what mindfulness would teach us is, of course that's the case. You know, wake up in there. You know, of course that's the case, because that's what life only is. Life is only uncertainty. Life is only change. And if you can get that into your thick skull, and I'm talking to me about that, if I can get that into my thick skull and truly accept that, then you shrug your shoulders at uncertainty. Yeah. It will be what it will be. Um, and you can then, two things result from that. One is you're happier because you're not worried about the uncertainty. It's not dragging you down. But the second thing is your mind is so much clearer because it's not dragged down by uncertainty, and therefore you can make the most of the uncertainty. Whatever comes, you'll make more of it. You know, and changes, you'll actually start to adapt to the changes and maybe anticipate changes and, and get more out of your life. And that's what the whole philosophy of Taoism is, is recognising that there's this big flow of change called the universe, and if you can see it properly and understand it properly, you can work within that flow more fulfillingly in your life. Yeah. And I think that's a really profound way of seeing life. You're, you're right but it takes work. And that, so, so that relates, therefore, to the two aspects of mindfulness. One is the understanding bit. Understanding life, understanding the universe, understanding change, understanding uncertainty, and that's all to get it in your head. Then you've got to practice it so that you can live fruitfully and well and happily and in a, an altruistic kind way within that understood flow. If you just understand it and do nothing about it, your life's just as miserable. If you just do the practice but you don't understand the background to it, you, it will be as, as helpful. So the two things go hand in hand, understand and practice, understand and practice, which is why we do quite a lot of the free things we're doing just now. Some of them are courses to understand better, and a lot of the other ones are practices to get better at doing better. Yeah. yeah. Christine, your, your, your wife helped me with something. Uh, I'd messaged her, messaged her on Facebook, and it was uh, she helped me through a Japanese instructor. And it was, uh, let, let me make sure I get this right now, mono no aware, which is the uh, the acceptance of impermanence. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'll say that again, Mono, no Alari, which is something. See, I always well, think... Well, I don't know it. Christy know no better than me. Well, well, she, uh, I, I, I know the theory, but I know the, I know the philosophy. <laughs> yep. Uh, and, and as soon as you ask someone to translate something, especially if you put it out on social media, everybody thinks you're getting a tattoo. So <laughs> <laughs> that you, don't, you don't want something <laughs> written on you that's that's incorrect. That... I'll put that out there. I'm not actually going to get a tattoo with Japanese writing. Especially uh, not a tattoo saying impermanent. <laughs> well, well <laughs> although there's, there's, that's quite funny, I actually hadn't thought about that. But, uh, and again, you, uh, when I say what I'm about to say, I think some people think, oh, uh, uh, that's just nonsense. But mono no aware, this idea about impermanence is something that I definitely meditate on. It's definitely something that I spend a lot of time thinking about and the more that I become comfortable with that because of everything that you've just said that Mm -hmm. nothing absolutely nothing in this whole world ever stays the same and if Mm -hmm. you can not only accept it but enjoy the ride pretty much enjoy that absolutely absolutely uh, it just makes listen it's difficult the same as everything Uh, Everything's difficult, but it definitely can help people. Uh, and it sounds really cool yeah. as well. You know, the biggest part of that, you know, and that's great, the impermanence. You know, that's one of the Buddha's, I think, three fundamentals of life that he says that people should understand, impermanence. Um, the other ones being that we are not the self we think we are. Well, this constantly shift and changing self as well. You know, people tend to think of themselves as being the solid thing that life happens all around them, but they're actually changing as well. We thought the and, world was like that for centuries, so we did. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And and the third part is um human dissatisfaction in the mind. Mm-hmm. And we have to work with these three things. You know, but you know what you were saying there about impermanence, um where was where was it going with that? What were you just saying just towards the end? Uh? That perhaps that I was uh, becoming or trying my best to become more comfortable with the concept. Yes. It, now, when you take impermanence and you break it down, it's that therefore means that, and again, the Buddha said this beautifully well, he said, every moment you're born and die. Mm-hmm. So every next moment, is a new opportunity for a new you yep. to have a new life, you know, and and that means you know if you take that and impermanence, that means that you're going to end at one point. So every single moment, chance to live, chance to live, chance to live, and that could be filled with gratitude and activity, gratitude and kindness, you know, gratitude and and just relaxing and being alive. Now. That's an entirely different way, an entirely different way of thinking and being than the way our minds have structured us to think and live. You know, it's, it's, it's the, almost the opposite way of being. And that that faulty or flawed way that we've evolved to have, in my opinion, also then necessarily when we start to have ideas and structures you build in all the flaws to that. So the schools have got all the flaws and the capitalist system or market system's got all the flaws and the housing and everything's, all these flaws are built into the system because it's made by minds that have got all those flaws in it. And so you start to change internally and then those changes can happen, start to happen socially and culturally. Okay, uh, one one, one more thing that I want to explore with you before before I let you go, and you just said that again there. You've frozen for me just now, Karim. Sorry? You froze for me a second there, okay. so I didn't... Can we back, back now? Yep. Right, perfect. Uh, one, one last thing that I want to explore with you, and you just said that again, was, uh, was kindness. Okay. Uh, so... We're struggling with this, I think, at the moment. Uh, mm. Just person to person, uh, on social media, country to country. 
we, yeah, kindness. Let, let's 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 finish the talk by talking about kindness. Where, where has it gone? Uh, why has it gone? <laughs> how, how do we get it back? I, I think, firstly, if, from what we've spoken about before about constant change and uncertainty, uncertainty breeds polarization. Some people become kinder to help people and other people retreat into themselves. Um, constant change makes people worried and when you're worried you're less likely to be kind because you're trying to protect yourself. But then if you start to be aware of this and you're going on in your head, you can accept the uncertainty and accept the change and so your kindness can actually grow. I think the most important thing is to, to if you want to grow kindness in the world is to develop it in yourself, for yourself, to be kind to yourself, not grasping to yourself, not greedy for yourself, but kind to yourself, which means taking care of you. And again, another <laughs> biblical thing, you know, is Jesus said, love one another as thyself. Yeah. You can't love somebody else if you don't love yourself. You know, we should take care of our body as if we were a nurse or a doctor taking care of somebody else's body. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be putting junk in it because we wouldn't put junk in somebody else's body. I well, thought we wouldn't, yeah. you know, knowingly. And it's the same with the mind. We should be tender and caring to our own mind. We should give it rests. We should give it replenishment time. We should give it fun and laughter. We should stop giving it hours and hours and hours of draining so viewing or whatever. We, we should know what works for our mind and our body and we should offer it to ourselves. That is kindness. If you do that, kindness to others is just a natural consequence yeah. because you're thinking in terms of caring. And I think caring is, in its true sense, is pretty much indivisible. If you care for something fully, you will care for everything fully. But that requires work. It's all work. You know, I wish it was easy. I wish. I mean, I've said this before. You probably heard me say it in classes. You know, if there was a pill that made you do all this stuff, I would take it. You know, straight away. I don't. I don't like hard work if it's not necessary. But this is hard work, and it's hard work about the most important thing you have, which is the mind that. A, makes you feel the way you feel about being alive mm -hmm. and about other people. Kindness is is just an evolved human trait that you can nurture in the exact same way as you can plant a bush in a garden and water it and hope the sun shines on it. Yeah. It's just the exact same thing. But I agree with the great Irish playwright Samuel Beckett when he was asked about it, um, and he's when he was asked about life in general, and he says, kindness is all that matters. Yeah. Sure. Ultimately, in terms of human happiness, kindness is all that matters. It's, it's the most stunning thing. You know, I've been doing mindful walks, you know, for the public, you know, since lockdown, you know, and I, I sometimes stop and say, look at that wee drop of rain on that branch, you know, look how beautiful it is, it's like a diamond, you know, and you think, you know, so full of enthusiasm, you think, that's, that's stunning. Nothing is as stunning as kindness, you know. I mean, I have wept seeing somebody being kind to somebody else, you know, you just think, geez, if, if human beings were like that all the time, None of the woes that we've seen with, with the rise, you know, not Trump, not America, not what's happening in Yemen, not what's happening in Syria, you know, the sort of Myanmar just now. It's, and I know that's idealistic, but that's the reality. If people were wise and kind, you could have differences of opinion and still resolve them and people would be happy and they wouldn't be being destroyed all the time. And that's unbelievably tragic as somebody whose family lived through that sort of stuff. Yeah. You say it's unrealistic, but I, I said at the, and again, when 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 COVID nineteen struck, uh, people laugh at this, and I, I don't mind saying it again publicly, uh, and people can continue to laugh at this, but I don't think it was 
beyond realistic for, I'm starting to laugh myself now, I don't think it was beyond realistic for the world, the world to close down, work together, feed everybody, make sure everybody was safe, make sure everybody could stay indoors. We spoke about this on the podcast the last time. Mm -hmm. Our full economic worldwide system is designed in a, in a way that that doesn't allow for that. It doesn't allow for us to mm -hmm. care for everybody. Mm -hmm. I genuinely think we could have stopped us by coming together as a world. And people just say, oh, that's unrealistic. Why, why is it unrealistic? Why yeah. is it unrealistic to say that stay in the house for a month and we will feed you? We will make sure you have electricity and water to bathe your children and food to feed you and your family, et cetera, et cetera. And that's that's unrealistic, apparently. Yeah. yeah, there's a difference between what is possible or feasible, and I totally agree, that's all feasible, that is all doable. Yeah. What makes it realistic or unrealistic is the human mind. The minds of seven and a half billion people probably reduced down to the minds of a few thousand people. Yeah, yeah. Who, are in positions of power and influence and wealth. Um, and that's the minds that, if you can change the right minds, the world can become better quicker. Simple as that. I think we'll leave it on that, Martin. Uh, that's over an hour that I've kept you. Uh, that's fine. As, as always, I'll say I could have, I could sit here for another, another four hours or whatever and, and, and chat with you, but... Uh, no, as I say, the, the the fact that we managed to turn this around so quickly is 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 brilliant because it's exactly what I want to offer out there was your thoughts in, in this this conversation. So as always, Martin, thank you so much for, for coming on. It's an absolute pleasure. Thanks for asking me. Can you oh, good to see you again? You too. Uh, okay, I shall see you soon, Martin. And yep. as I say, thank you so much. I really appreciate take it. Take care. All you right, take care, Martin. Bye bye. Bye.